Hey, it's John and Mike, brew-dudes.com, and it's grab bag time. I think that uh, Mike said, because we're in deep with the uh, Jar of Destiny beers and, uh, and you know, it's just summertime vacation time, so we haven't had a chance to brew stuff, but we will. Uh, so here's another video. This is based on questions that viewers have written to us or have put in comments. And Mike has collected a whole bunch, and we're just gonna. Is this gonna be like kind of a fast-paced answer type thing? As fast as uh, as we care it, to as answer? it needs to be. Some of these will require okay. a little discussion, and but others will be pretty straightforward. Okay. Well, I am listening, and I am ready to answer if I can. Okay. First question. Okay. Um, how do you carbonate beer in the U Works growler? Oh. Okay. So the U uh, U keg, yes, comes with. Um, uh, it's it's uh, there's a shaft. <laughs> I was trying to figure out a better word for that, but that's what it is. Uh, little CO2 cartridges can be put inside the shaft. You screw that into um, a mechanism that has a little needle, pops the uh, top of the canister, and then that is attached to a dial, mm -hmm. which then you can turn up, which then releases more gas from the canister, mm -hmm. and in a closed system. The CO2 has nowhere else to go but into the beer, so that's what I do. How long does it take? Uh, two, um, about two days. Depends on temperature, of course. I try to keep it, I keep things chilled. So even before I put uh, fermented beer um, into the UK from a fermenter, uh, it's already chilled down and then yep. cap it. And then we put it back in the fridge. Awesome. So here's a question that I, I, I gave an answer to online, but um, I'm curious to get your answer and then I will feed in my opinion on this okay. too. Um, someone asked, what is a hop stand? Ah, okay. What's your opinion? What, what, what do you call a hop stand? Okay, I'm gonna answer poorly so you can be the hero. <laughs> no, I, this is my thought of a hop stand um, because I feel like the term whirlpool is very much for commercial breweries that have that kind of arm that you know does that thing, and you can do it like I guess in your own homebrew um, setup. But my feeling is a hop stand is add is uh, a um, hop addition that is post boil, and for me it's to you know extract more aroma uh, characteristics, flavor characteristics, but it's it's your wort chilled down from boiling temperatures. Like I, I think a lot of recipes say like add a flame out, which is fine, but that uh, you don't really have a good sense of what temperature the wort is when you throw those hops in. It could be right off boil, so uh, just a few degrees, you know, less than boiling temperature. The hop stand to me is a deliberate procedure in which you're chilling wort down to some high temperature, much higher than, you know, fermentation temperatures or whatever, but somewhere where you're able to extract more oils, more uh, flavor compounds, and the stand part is for some set amount of time. So when I did those uh, last two smash beers, I did a deliberate hop stand where I said I would chill down to 180 degrees, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, add my hops and let it sit for 10 minutes and then continue the chilling process to get it down to fermentation temperatures and then pitch my yeast. So that's my thought of a hop stand. Mm. I was you? way off because I thought, thought it was just that time in between hop additions when you're standing there with the hops <laughs> waiting. No, no. The <laughs> hop stand. Uh, I, I was I trying think, to make you a uh, hero, bro. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I think I would, I would, I would take, um, I would apply an even more broader definition. Is okay. that um, a hop stand is 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 defined as letting hops sit at under defined conditions. I see. Right. That's a, a broad general way to define sure. it. So to say I'm going to steep these hops at flame out for 10 minutes. That's a hop stand. Sure. I'm going to chill to 180 and let's stand for 30 minutes. That's a hop stand. Uh, in a way, uh, doing a dry hop addition is a hop stand, yeah. right? It's, it's, so it's, it's, a hop stand is just a, a, a simple one-way phrase of saying, 
but you have to define it. It's it's not a defined thing on its own. You have to give some character to it. Meaning, I like that. 180 for 15 minutes, or, or flame out for 20, sure. or whatever it's going to be. You know, nice. I love it. Um, and then a whirlpool is really the is a is a type of hop stand where the word is essentially, if you've got the equipment to do it, is being circulated. Yes. It just helps you with extraction. So maybe you can do it faster. So that, that's what I view a hop stand as. Love it. Um, comparing Nova Lager cleanliness, we both talked about how clean those Super fermentations clean. were. Yep. Do you think that that was, um, how would you compare it to the cleanliness of say using <laughs> USO5, basically any of those Chico California ale strains? Because those strains are always referred to as being really clean. How yeah. would you compare the two? I would say that they're, that uh, say a Chico strain, US05, uh, they're clean for ale yeasts. Uh, I think there's still a an ester profile that you're not going to get from a lager strain. I think Nova, Nova Lager, I had an, an R there, so that's, okay. that's, that's my New England from. thing, that's right? Um, the Nova Lager strain, uh, I don't think there's there's any esters that I get out of that strain at all. Like That is, to me, ferments beer like a macro lager strain does like, yeah i agree i think i think nova lager is so i think it's cleaner than what you're going to achieve with chico that isn't always a good thing nope. depends on what you're trying to do exactly um i think we both commented for me a fermentation with nova leaves no yeast character <laughs> what you're tasting <laughs> yeah. is the is beer if it was not fermented but it's fermented. I mean, that's really what it is. So yeah. I find I just found Nova to be. There's no yeast uh, flavors that come out of that fermentation yeah. with Nova Lager. Yes, yeah. true. Agreed. Agreed. So I th I think it's great. I can't wait to brew more beers with it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll do a Chico side by side. It'll be fun. We there there is more yeast experimentations to come. I just yeah. have to source it and then find the time to brew three small batches. Yeah. <laughs> on the same day. Yeah. It's. Uh, I'm doing it for the dash, All but right. I'll figure it out. Um, on your most recent German pills in the video, someone said, I didn't catch whether or not you mentioned doing a de-rest. Did you do a diacetyl rest? Oh, crap. And are there any general thoughts on diacetyl rest? So I'm adding to that. But why don't you just, did you do a de-rest I'm, try I'm trying to remember. I think I may have because I feel paranoid not to. And because it's the jar of destiny, I want to do everything I can to make the make best great. example okay. of the style as I can. Yep. But so ye actually, yes, I know I did because that I also fermented that in the keg, and that um, was a I, after I took it out of the refrigerator, which was set to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. I took it out and just let it sit in my basement at basement temperatures which were in you know probably a little warmer than yeah. room temperatures for a couple of days two days so you gotta think that in that first day it's warming up 20 plus degrees fahrenheit uh to you know the the ambient temperature of the space it's in and then i just let it sit for a day and then i feel like all right this this is okay <laughs> i've done all i can and then I throw it back in the chill chest to bring down to somewhere closer to freezing. Um, I've definitely noticed at times that if the fermentation is good from the beginning, that I've gotten away with lagers where I don't intentionally do a de-rest. Yep. Although almost all beer I brew, whether it be a lager or an ale, I do tend to ramp up three or four degrees at the end anyway as it's starting to slow down just to keep fermentation going. Yeah. All yeast responds that way to increases in temperature will keep it going a little bit longer True. as it's trying to poop out. That's actually something from my English ale brewing days. If the temperature fluctuates at all up or down, yeast tends to go, I'm done. Yeah. Even if it's not only remotely done. So anyway, so I've always tend to ramp up temperature at the end. Uh, the, the thoughts on d -rest, I don't know. Every t like every time I read an article, it's like, not really sure if you need to do one anymore. <laughs> I think um, we talked about this once before, I think, but I think the major industrial malting complex has created malt with far less precursors that would sort of put you in some of those situations. Now, yes, diacetyl is a yeast derived thing, but it's all metabolism based and what nutrients are available. So I have a feeling that 
some of those issues are, you know, not not there. Anyway, uh, so when we had our low alcohol beer, uh, come that what um, mild yep. beer that I made. Sure. Uh, the question was, why not boil beer to remove alcohol? Um, <laughs> so the thing is with that is that you can certainly remove alcohol through boiling. Um, the problem is you'll concentrate all the flavors in the beer because you're going to lose some water with the alcohol. It's not a controlled process. The other thing is if you just take beer in containers, like commercial beer, your homebrew beer, and subject it to heat for an hour, 30 minutes, you're going to accelerate staling um, reactions even in a closed container with minimal amount of oxygen. So boiling beer is going to really stale the daylights out of it um, if you try to remove alcohol from that way. So it's really not practical. Uh, in theory, physically, it is 100% possible, but you'll end up with, you know, Something weak you old like tasting, tasting yeah. open, stale, gross cardboard right beer. It's worth a test. Yep. Um, Maybe not boil it, but bring it up to temperatures where alcohol starts evaporating out of it. Even then, you are accelerating oxidation but reactions. Still want to try it. Do it. Make your <laughs> shitty beer. Go ahead. Um, hey. Why not? Uh, why not? So this is from our drink and dump, drink or dump oh, series. Oh jeez. Um, someone asked this question. I'm just going to throw it out there for fun. Yeah. Um, why not cook ribs with your dump beer? Like why not throw it out? Like why not cook with it? And I think I mentioned a little bit of cooking sure. with it. Um, I just didn't have any plans to cook with it. That's yeah, all. Yeah. I, I don't know. Some of those dumpers, like the, the. The funk character stuff would probably just be too prominent to maybe reduce down and as for a sauce or something. I don't know about you, but there is no liquid involved when I cook ribs. <laughs> I think even if I were to cook something else, there is just a catharsis of getting rid of bad beer that's been yeah. sitting in my basement for way too long. And it made, you know, my spouse happy yes. to get rid of it. Um, on the same trend with our low alcohol video, um, why do people want low alcohol beer? It's like decaffeinated coffee. Why? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually saw this comment too. Uh, <laughs> I love it though. It's, it's valid. It's See, fine. yeah, decaffeinated coffee. Because I feel the same way. Yeah, well, you don't even drink coffee, so I don't know. I, you know, Athletic Brewing Company makes tremendous, tremendous. beers, and uh, sometimes, I don't know, it's probably because I'm old now. Uh, you know, after doing a long day out in the yard working and stuff in the heat, and then you just don't feel like getting a buzz, yeah. you know? Drinking a, like an athletic was uh, kind of game changing. It was uh, like, all right, cool, I can still enjoy the flavor beer because this is pretty darn good and not feel like I'm ready for a nap or something. Yeah. Again, I'm old, but um, I don't know, like decaffeinated coffee, I don't know if that's really apples to <laughs> apples, because I don't know if I enjoy the flavor of coffee as much as I do beer, and um, I think I think coffee is is wonderful, and I know there are a lot of people uh, that like get into you know uh, where the beans are grown and the roasts and all of that, and then the preparation is a certain thing, but I, I just it never. It never clicked with me the same way that beers click with me as a like a um, as a hobby as a process. Yeah, yeah, and just like a flavor, you know, um, enjoyment thing. Mm -hmm. Like coffee to me, you know, has more of a purpose of um, getting me awake. <laughs> and again, I'm old. Um, but the, the caffeinated coffee, I guess, if it tasted better, I just I. I've, I've never heard anybody say like this the co the caffeinated coffee tastes just as good as the caffeinated stuff and it's again probably some kind of something to do with the process of the caffeinating you have to beverage. sacrifice something in order to make yeah. it happen same yeah. thing with removing alcohol from beer you yep. sacrifice something yep um so same tendency same in the same vein uh one of our viewers from across the pond asked why do you think there's a tendency for craft brewers uh towards higher strength beers, particularly in the States. Um, why do you think that trend is? I have my opinions on that. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, it's funny because I think that we've been around for a, a, a number of years and it seemed like to make a name for yourself in the craft beer industry, it was all about, you know, being super strong and like, oh, well, this one has, you know, X number of IBUs or, you know, X percent alcohol or 
whatever it was. I don't know. It was just like, it was a way to stand out. And of course, if it stood out, then it must be good. And then you talk about it with your friends and they tell two friends and so on. So I wonder if that's sort of it. I don't know if that, you know, has died down, but it's, it, it seems like <laughs> the American way is just to bigger, add more. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Yeah, bigger yeah. and better. I so. think there's, there's, two, there's two other things driving this. One, there's a value proposition. Uh, craft beer is becoming pretty expensive. Um, I mean, you might pay $18 now for a four pack. Oh my. Right? It's not, it's not cheap anymore. Um, it's not super expensive either. But I, so I think there's a value proposition there of consumers definitely go to the store. They see $18 for 5% and they see $18 for 8% alcohol and they send to go that way. They go to the higher alcohol. It just is what it is. Um, and then the other aspect to that is that, um, so from a technical brewing standpoint, the, 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 the category that's really driving that higher alcohol demand is IPA. Um, and there is something to be said for more alcohol. Alcohol is a solvent mm. and it'll hold on to, those hop oils are not soluble in water, but they're soluble in an organic solvent like ethanol. So a little more ethanol in solution when you're dry hopping helps pull more oils into solution. Maybe, right? I think there's some other things on the other side of you can over hop and lose beers. That's probably has to do more within the aqueous side of things. But I think that's one of the things our love of really hoppy beers, at least in the early days, 10 years ago, <laughs> sort of drove higher alcohol in order to try to get more hop character. I think we've got better techniques for hop character now and better hops. I'll just leave it at that. Um, all right, two more questions. Two I, more questions. Um, do you get smaller bubbles of carbonation when pressure fermenting versus forced carbonation? I think this gets back to the idea of doing one. bottle conditioning yeah. in general yeah. versus uh, forced carbonation. Some people really talk about getting uh, smoother, finer bubbles when you bottle condition versus when you keg beer. I keg all of my beer now, 99% of the beer I keg, and I'm not unhappy with the carbonation level. However, I will say, I think bottle conditioned beer is superior. Yeah. Um, it, it's not like light night and day, but it is superior. I've never really necessarily noticed the bubbling thing, but from, from a physics standpoint, right, from a physics standpoint, I think that when you think about conditioning in a um, in a bottle, you've got a what happens. A bottles tend to clear up faster than a keg does. Yeah. Stuff settles out because it's a smaller distance to fall. Gravity is working on this those particles the same way, and it's got to drop this far in a bottle or this far in a keg. And so you hit the bottom of the bottle before you hit the bottom of the keg. Hmm. I think the bubble phenomenon then is stuff that's still suspended in the beer. Mm. So if you have less stuff causing nucleation in the bottle. Your, your bubbles tend to seem finer because they're not as big. It's the same thing with like raindrops coming out of the sky, look it up. Um, so I think that's what, I think that's part of what drives, this is just my thoughts on this. I've thought about this off and on over the years, but um, as far as it relates to pressure fermentation, um, I haven't done enough playing with pressure fermentation to carry that 12 PSI of pressure ferment in like and try to then move the carbonated beer in just some other vessel. Now, if you've got a unitank or you've got a floating dip tube type of anvil or the all round or those types of systems where you ferment and do it all in one vessel, uh, maybe maybe that does work. I don't know. Yeah. And you get finer bubbles that way. But I bet if you really paid attention to how much stuff is it still in, in um, particulate causing more um, nucleation, I think the bubbles would be bigger. Um, all right, last question. This question has come up a handful of times. Um, <laughs> What happened to the intro music? Yeah, Mike, what happened to it? So the intro music, I'll let you guys figure it out. Um, there's no need to comment on this because I just, but no. a lot of our previous videos, all of our previous videos, there was intro music, which is not owned by us. It's owned by someone else. YouTube does not pick it up in the algorithm when you're uploading as it's copyrighted material. But I was getting more and more nervous that YouTube would eventually, that algorithm would eventually figure out what song that is from, that little clip. It's only about X seconds. I'm not even going to say how long it is, but um, we somehow escaped the algorithm pinging us, but I thought it better moving forward to just go to a generic uh, little musical piece, just so it's not fade from black into the video, hard cut, just have some sort of musical piece, but I got rid of the copyrighted music um, as our regular intro for fear of having to pull down 
a bunch of videos or go back and somehow hundreds fix it. Of so videos. hundreds of videos. So yeah. that's where the intro music went. That's why we pulled it down. And uh, there were a few weeks where we had no music and I just didn't like that transition. So now we have this stock little thing in there. And there's, there's more coming, don't worry. We're gonna, oh, we'll okay. spice it up. We'll spice right. it up eventually. I thought you were gonna like a, do a call for a uh, better opening. Hey, someone wanna write us some like, you know, killer rock five second intro. Sure, sure, and then sure, of course. we'll use that moving forward. All it, right. It, it's sort of iconic, you know, cause that, Every time I'd watch the videos, it'd be like, oh, it's one of ours. It's all one of ours, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. In any case, uh, you know, we'll just we'll put that out there. All right, that's it. Stop right there. Hopefully you enjoy this very long video. This is more than uh, you thanks know. Thanks to come until the end. Yeah, so thanks for watching. Um, maybe we'll do this again sometime when, you know, we don't have much in the can in terms of, <laughs> or in the keg, that is, for uh, talking about it and, you know, having a good time here on on camera. So if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Hopefully the algorithm doesn't shut us down so we can come back next week. For John and Mike, <laughs> brewdashdudes.com. Brew on. Cheers. Okay. I'm ready when you're ready. That beer looks oxidized. Uh, <laughs>